Welcome to Zykedown. Today we're gonna break down every level in one of the most iconic video games ever conceived, Super Mario Bros. Let us begin. World 1-1 is a level with a masterclass in game design, a standard that'll be held up for the entirety of this playthrough with only a couple hiccups. Miyamoto and Tezuka, who I will henceforth refer to as the designers, knew they had to teach you what the game was about with utmost efficiency. From the first frame, they are already influencing us to do something, that is, move right, indicated by the wide open space in that direction, along with Mario's face wishing to run that way. It's then that you meet him. The man, the myth, the legend, the one with the highest player kill count in all of gaming, the first Goomba. The designers wanted an easy challenge for you to overcome, so they threw this guy in. All you've got to do is jump on his head or avoid him. Either way is perfectly fine for advancing further on. Oh, but what about those question mark blocks? Their questioning nature, along with their glowing body, allures you into hitting them, causing the good old mushroom to expose himself and head right. This snowballs into it hitting the pipe and heading straight for you, where you'll likely touch it whether you want to or not. And what does it do but make you larger? showing you that mushrooms are your friends, not your enemies. At least in this game. There are a few pipes of differing heights that you can kite without respite. You'll learn how high you can jump and that you don't need to leap the maximum height to overcome an obstacle. The first gap has no enemies, the second gap has one, and the third gap has two. A natural progression in difficulty that shouldn't be too hard for a newbie to pass. If you experiment with the pipes, then you may find yourself diving into one. Behold the sub areas, bonus sections of a level that tend to contain a lot of coins for collection. They're less about challenge and learning something new and more about rewarding you for exploring the level. Exiting these areas will often drop you further into the main course, such as here, but not always. If you didn't take this warp pipe, there's a chance you'll activate a hidden block, which can only be seen after contact's been made, a cool addition to the game that makes one look at levels in a different light. May I introduce you to pit number one, where instant death occurs should you fall in. I imagine first timers intuitively understand that falling into the pit means death and would try to avoid it. Not like this pit's hard since it's only two blocks wide and there isn't anything in the way to screw the jump up. The second pit, however, is three blocks wide, with a couple Goombas placed afterwards, necessitating you to react quickly after landing. There's also a couple sneaky Goombas up above, showing that enemies won't always be found in comfortable spots for engagement, but dirty spots as well, where they come out of nowhere. What's cool about their placement here is that even though they fall down to you, they land on a lower platform, giving you a moment to recognize this unforeseen threat and get to safety. And hey, they may inspire you to travel up there yourself, which makes it easier to pass that second pit we talked about earlier. Oh, here he comes, it's the one and only Koopa Troopa, making his first appearance. Unlike Goombas, which only require a single stomp to defeat, these guys require a stomp and a kick, which sends them shooting out like a projectile. I cannot stress enough how badly the designers want you to learn this. They went as far as to place six Goombas directly after the Koopa Troopa, which is the exact amount needed for a one-up. Not only does it show you how much destruction a Koopa shell can cause under the right conditions, but also that chaining together certain attacks will grant you an extra life, which is super important in a game that wants to kill kill you. But say you don't hit the Koopa Troopa and instead hit this block first. That would cause a star to pop out and hop around. This might spur some panic because it looks important but can be hard to catch. However, all these blocks were placed in such a way that grabbing this star isn't actually all that hard. When you do, you start glowing and the music changes, indicating that something big just happened. With this rush of power, you can obliterate the aforementioned enemies with ease. Sure, you don't get a one up, but you learned of an entirely new power up, so either method of desecration works. I should also mention that this is the first time that an item has popped out of a regular looking block, letting you know that it's worth interacting with everything just in case. 
These staircases are meant to teach the B dash, where holding down the B button lets Mario run. Failure to do so will likely result in falling into this gap, which ain't a big deal, but this section builds up to jumping over a pit, warning you to figure out how to make these jumps soon. Nearing the end, you're greeted with two Goombas to gleefully kill before ascending Starry the Staircase and leaping towards the flagpole, thus marking the end of a brilliant crafted introduction to the game's core mechanics. World 1-2 is a stark contrast to World 1-1 in both its aesthetics and design. This contrast is highlighted by the change in music, backdrop, transition screen, and level entrance, with Mario falling from the top. Instead of running around freely in the open, you're more constricted and need to be careful of tight spaces, which couldn't be more evident from the two Goombas that waddled towards you at the beginning. This is a similar opening to 1-1, but the added Goomba makes the situation a little spookier, urging you to either go for it and stomp them both, or avoid them by safely taking the path above. Either way, you're exposed to the dangers of a restrictive environment. This pillar section teaches multiple things at once. It shows how jumps will alternate between varying heights, and how precise future jumps will end up being through its usage of one block gaps. Unless you're claustrophobic, there's no punishment for falling in the gaps. It's merely a testing area for precision jumping meant to give you a feel for how these kinds of sections will work. This block section is too high for most players to access, hence why these two coins were placed lower, enticing you into reaching them first. You may run and jump, leaping everywhere looking for a solution. Eventually, or from the start, you may hit a block while big, destroying it. Clearing out these blocks allows you to reach the lower coins as well as the ones up above, a nice reward for learning how to shape the environment to one's advantage. If you're resourceful enough, you may even think to destroy the ceiling's blocks, creating a gap that you could use to access the ceiling itself. A normal jump won't do though, you must run and jump to pull this off, and if you do, then you'll receive the luxury of skipping over half the level. While you wouldn't be learning firsthand all of the things the skip sections want to teach you, you'll at least get a feel for what the message was by looking at them. Most new players won't access the ceiling though, and will instead continue onwards facing two Koopa Troopas in a row. Not too big of a deal if you face the first Koopa from 1-1, a simple jump and a kick will send him flying through his friend and right through this one block gap, hitting three other enemies. This maneuver is pretty cool and shows just how versatile kicking a Koopa shell can be. You're then left with a peculiar situation, the one block gap. If you're small, then you can just walk right through, but if you're big, then you can't. Either way, you learn that your height can affect which places you're able to access. You could either destroy the blocks above you to go around the hole, or fidget with the controls a bit and learn the sliding crouch, where you run and hold down. Some coins are scattered on this ledge, which, surprise, can be obtained by hitting the block you're under. Good to remember. If multiple blocks are destroyed here, then you'll see a mushroom pop out of a regular looking block, similar to the star from 1-1. It really fuels your desire to destroy everything, doesn't it? There are three Goombas here, and they're all falling from up above. You may remember two Goombas doing something similar in 1-1, but there you had a safeguard via this lower platform. Here, there is no safeguard. They're falling to ground level where you are, putting you into a position where you need to react fast. These coins up here can only be accessed by leaping from the lower platform, and if that's done, then you have the potential to discover an interesting 1-up mushroom. Upon popping out, it'll move right as expected, necessitating you to keep it within the game's camera so that it doesn't despawn. That is, if you're up for the challenge. By no means do you have to follow it. You could lay back and take your time if you want. Having the choice is pretty cool, but what's cooler is that you can cheat this challenge. If you make it pop out and destroy the ceiling blocks next to it, then it'll immediately fall down. Either that, or you can head to the ceiling yourself to grab it. So many choices for a cute little trial. Introducing the Piranha Plant. Are you noticing how the designers are introducing new enemies at a slow rate? They don't want to overwhelm you, so they build up the roster with care so you can get used 
just how they work. Up until now, every pipe has been safe to land on, but these enemies change everything. You've got to check each pipe to ensure it's clear of vines, otherwise you'll shrink or worse. It's no accident that the first warp pipe of the piranha plant has a sub area attached. The designers want you to know that plant or not, you've got to explore a lot. Oddly enough, the sub area's exit is only a few steps away from its entrance, whereas one one sub area exit was miles away from its entrance. This difference lets you know that not all warp pipes were made the same. Further on, you're met with the newest in moving platform technology. One set moves down, and one set moves up, teaching you that platforms can move up and down. Okay, look, not all lessons are going to be sunshines and rainbows, okay? Besides, these infinitely spawning moving platforms are a hint to what the next level's theme is going to be about. Oh, and we can't forget the red Koopa Troopa. What makes him different from his predecessors is that he turns around when coming upon a ledge instead of walking right off. You'll notice that he was placed directly before a ledge to hit this point home. If you take the platforms upwards and run along the ceiling, you'll encounter the one, the only, Warp Zone, allowing transportation across the worlds. This is an amazing reward for players that decided to go above and beyond, literally, when exploring sections of the level. You may think I'm exaggerating, but really, attempting to access this ceiling when the warp pipe cuts off here, and continuing to run past the cutoff warp pipe, it just looks like a glitch, or an oversight maybe, but nope, totally intentional. The original warp pipe leads back to the surface, where the levels ended in a similar fashion to 1-1, letting you know that, yeah, this is how we're gonna end levels, take it or leave it. World 1-3 is much more difficult than the levels that came before. If there was an early level you struggled on as you got accustomed to the game, it was probably this one. It begins with raising platform jumps to bring your elevation higher. You soon come upon a moving platform rising and falling. The ones before in 1-2 either only rose or only fell. But this one is alternating between the two, allowing you to get the goodie from the block at the lower level, take the platform up, and get the coins at the higher level. Moving platform technology, you never let us down! Saying goodbye to our old friend, we meet a new foe, the Red Paratroopa. This encounter may feel a little intimidating at first glance, until you realize that he, like the platform from earlier, only moves up and down. Hey, wait a minute, you think? I could safely stomp on the grounded Koopas from earlier, so who's to say I can't stomp on the flying ones for a boost? And you'd be right. You can throw an enemy down to the pit below where they'll suffer, all in the name of extra airtime. Pretty sick. What's sicker is that the moving platforms are back and they're sliding left and right. There's no enemies during this section because the designers aren't evil, for the most part. They want you to succeed, I promise. With careful hands and patience that's tested by the alluring coins above, you can make it across with ease. If your time is good enough, you can actually knock this Koopa Troopa shell into his flying friend as a cold trick shot. There's another sliding platform, but this time it's hovering above... Starry, who was intact before, but is broken now. Guess that goes to show that level endings won't always be so clear cut. And as we can see here, the castle from before is a lot bigger now. Well, it makes sense, cause upon finishing the level, you're introduced to... World 1-4, a castle-themed level. Right from the start, you're met with a pit. A pit filled with lava, but a pit nonetheless, indicating instant death. It's pretty clear that the designers want you to know they're trying to kill you now. A question mark block is placed above what looks like to be a fire bar. It's likely you've already seen fire before with the fire flower power up, but in case you haven't, this obstacle shows how deadly fire can be. A quick maneuver is necessary to yoink the power up, or you can just ditch it entirely and move on with your life. Make your choice. This long corridor is filled with fire bars designed to ruin your day. Using the crouching slide you learned from 1-2 can help you out here if you're big. Otherwise, your patience will be tested. Until the end of the level. Seriously. This whole place is littered with fire bars that want a piece of you. But what makes them different from Goombas, Koopa Troopas and the like is that they are stationary and predictable. 
all they do is rotate clockwise or counterclockwise. If you realize that and take your time, then they aren't a big deal. Afterwards, fireballs will fly in from the right side of the screen. This will be very surprising to first timers, which is why the designers threw in a hole for you to fall into to avoid them. They don't go this slow, so you're free to observe how they work for as long as you want, given the timer doesn't run out, until you feel confident enough to take up the challenge. If you haven't encountered any hidden blocks yet, you'll likely do so here, since a few were scattered around. Why? I like to think they're meant to keep you safe in the hole, but also to let you know that they exist, maybe? When making your escape, you have the option of taking shelter and yet another hole before fighting Bowser, my favorite Pokemon. With how the arena set up and what he looks like, it's clear that this guy's stronger than the others. But what's this? There's a glowing axe to the right. Even if you don't notice the axe or pay much mind to it, you're gonna feel compelled to move to the right side of the screen regardless because that's how you've been progressing in the game thus far. But before you head right, you need to avoid Bowser. You might jump on him first since he looks like a Koopa Troopa, but that'll result in getting hurt. Guess those spikes aren't just for show. Now that you know his entire body is pain, that platform's looking kinda nice, huh? It leads you right to the right where you can touch the axe and fell the beast. But that's not the only way to beat him. If you have a fire flower and try shooting a bunch of fireballs at him, then he'll eventually die. It's pretty cool that they give you that option. After a job well done, you're not met with the princess, but Toad, who tells you she's in another castle. Drat. Maybe next time, sport. World 2-1. Now that the designers have taught you the basics, you'll start to see more wacky creations as time goes on. And what could be wackier than two Koopa Troopas in a hole? I don't know, Zoom's like what? I'll tell you what! Kicking one while they're in the hole. This causes them to get stuck in a loop where they bounce off the two walls for eternity. It really hammers into your head that Koopa shells can and will bounce off of walls and to look out for that danger in the future. If you happen to hit a hidden block here, then you'll get rewarded with a coin. At that point, you've got to rack your brain for what the designers could be trying to lead you towards. And in this case, it's the empty space directly above your head, hinted at by the bricks that stop there. You haven't forgotten about the lesson with those two walls from earlier, have you? I hope not, because it's only been about like 20 seconds. <laughs> A similar situation's happening here, except with pipes. Does that change how the shell will respond? Nah, so you've still got to be careful. If you wait for this Koopa Troopa to fall off the platform and hit him towards the enemies, then you can score a 1-up. Just don't waste it by succumbing to the ricocheting shell soon after. Finding this star may feel good, but what I think feels better is discovering this little secret right here. The Vine, which leads to a special kind of sub-area that's way up in the clouds. These havens place the coins higher than Mario's jump height from ground level, necessitating you to become buddy-buddy with the moving platform. This creates an interesting challenge, where you're leaping for money while also keeping an eye on the platform so it doesn't leave you. What might be spooky about this section is how it forces you into a pit, and those have been deadly up until this point, but nah, it safely drops you back into the main level. Should you not enter this sub-area, you could enter a different one via this PP pipe. P -p Piranha plant pipe. <laughs> Which will give you a case of the deja vus. Passing the plants will lead you to a green paratroopa. See, with the red ones, they actually flew, but these ones just kind of bounce? most of the time. So they may come as a surprise, but as with nearly all surprises in this game, they're shown to you in a safe area. How kind of our lovely designers. These Koopas require one stomp to rid them of their wings and an additional stomp to get them into kicking position. Good to know, since two of them come right after, and you wouldn't want to be in a dangerous position without that knowledge. Oh hey, Starry the Staircase decided to evolve into a wall. Well, it's a good thing the coveted spring is here to help you. A simple push of the jump button while on it will send you way up. And of course, since this is a safe area, you're free to test out this mechanic as much as you like before proceeding. What's kind of cool here is that you don't even need to use the spring to overcome the wall. If you jump around enough, you'll hit a hidden block, which grants you the height to overcome your demons. 
Remember how World 1-2 began with Mario entering a warp pipe and falling into the underground? Well, World 2-2 starts with him entering a warp pipe and attempts to drown him. How's that for a change of pace? Welcome to Water Level! You'll immediately notice that the gameplay's changed. You're no longer running on the ground, but swimming in the water. The A button doesn't make you jump, but bounce up a bit. Inputting nothing causes you to sink, and you suddenly grow a fear of these tentacle things. You should notice how the starting area you're plopped in is fairly open and free of danger, though. The designers aren't so evil that they literally leave you to drown. After all, they want you to swim, and swim you will. You might get the bright idea to try and jump, land on the bloopers, but to no avail. Here's where fireballs would be incredibly helpful despite the back of your head telling you that they shouldn't work underwater. These pits may seem perplexing at first. Why should I worry about falling into them? I can easily swim out before I get anywhere close to the bottom. You may think before attempting to grab the coins until you notice that it's a little harder to get out than you may have anticipated. Yeah, they like to suck you in, so be careful. Swimming onwards, you'll find that the rest of the level is fairly tame. There isn't that much to explore besides the other two pits. Seems like they wanted the first water level to be a fairly easy one, considering it introduces a new form of gameplay. That doesn't stop you from a flagpole finish, though. World 2-3 is, frankly, utterly insane. The actual layout of the level is as simple as can be, there's not much to talk about. But the level's layout isn't the challenge, it's the enemies in the level, those being jumping cheap cheeps. TERRIFYING! Now I know what you're thinking, shouldn't they have been in the water level prior? And you'd be right, up until the point that the designers thought it'd be just hilarious to move them from swimming in the water to jumping on land. And thus, this monstrosity of a level was born. Moving on! World 2-4, The Second Castle, where you meet the best pet of all, Potaboos. Don't hug them though, or you'll become one yourself. They leap out of the lava and dive back in, requiring you to be aware of their peekaboo nature. The split path has one fire bar on the top and three on the bottom, which makes the top path seem safer, but since fire bars go in a circle, both sides get the heat. Me personally, I'd take the lower path because I like sliding under the fire. Goodness, my patented moving platforms, what do they do to you? There's big ol' strings going through you guys. Does it have an effect on the gameplay? I don't think so, but this firebar's placement's a little scary. This section of the level should be familiar. Fireballs are coming from the right side, and you're given a hole to hide yourself in. You'd expect there to be another hole to hide in right after, but nope. Two pits to doom, you've got to get past while avoiding the flames. At least there's a couple holes right before Bowser. Quite kind of him to make those for you, huh? All of his fights are going to be pretty similar to one another, albeit with changes to the arena to spice things up. If you wanted to perform a full jump, then these blocks will block you, making you more vulnerable to Bowser's fireballs. If you're big, then you have the option of destroying these blocks and hoofing it to the moving platform where you can grab thy axe and slay thy Bowser. But in the event of you being small, I guess World 3-1 decided it was nighttime. That's ominous. Oh, but forget that. This level contains my favorite sub-area in the whole game, the W Room. Named after the bricks that are shaped like a W, this sanctuary will delete every L someone's given you throughout your life. It's amazing. If you were a fool and didn't enter that glorious room, then you'd kill a few Goombas and walk right past its exit. A normal Tuesday. There's something about this bridge that I like. Don't you get the feeling that this bridge is important somehow? Well it is! Hidden block 1-up mushroom, it's always watching. These blocks are a little awkward to hit, but if you manage it, then your starry-eyed friend will leap towards you, and I'd recommend you grab him since the upcoming section will hit you like a hammer, bro. Whereas most enemy introductions are done in safe areas where you can learn their behaviors, the Hammer Brother cares not, and debuts alongside another one of its kind to smack you into the ground. They can leap between platforms and will throw hammers in an arc like mad. If you didn't grab that star from earlier and don't have a fire flower, then you may be feeling some pain. Not all hope is lost though, since you can defeat them by hitting the block they're standing on. Ain't that neat? 
Oh no, it's the spring of shame. Let's hope you got enough practice in the one from 2-1, because otherwise you might throw yourself into a pit of my Mario's. I swear the spring has killed me more than some enemies have in this game. If you can get past this insurmountable monster and hit this brick, then you'll find yourself in a coin wonderland. Some cloud platforms accompany your ride this time, and although they look friendly, they could potentially screw with your landing on the moving platform. You've got to work for those coins. Not taking the vine will bring you to a potential slaughter fest via Koopa Shell. Just jump, kick, and bask in your glory. Speaking of glory, I present to thee the Life Bringer Staircase. If you know, then you know. World 3 2 asks but a simple question Do you like to kill Goombas and Koopa Troopas? Because if so, then it offers instruments of torture designed to eliminate them. The first section is begging you to kick this Koopa Troopa into all of its allies behind him, thereby destroying multiple families. The enemies after that are stuck in a hole and can be eliminated by a shell kick as well. The Koopa Troopa next door can be sent into a tidal pool of confusion as he bounces off each wall endlessly. And to make matters worse for these guys, a free star was put in plain sight! It's not even trying to be sneaky! Oh man, a lone block, not gonna hit that one, of course you are! There's not even a chance for you to miss grabbing it, cause it'll hop on the path to the right, which is flatter than Sticker Star's gameplay. Upon absorbing this star, you'll have enough time to obliterate every foe up until the gray pipe, where it'll finally run out. The only obstacle in your path during this massacre is a single jump over a couple pits. That's it. And when the star runs out, there's probably going to be actual enemies to fight, right? Oh look, a Koopa Troopa with a bunch of Goombas behind it. Not a single enemy stood a chance in this level. Did the designers feel particularly cruel the day they made it? I don't know if I want to know. I hope you're feeling athletic, cause World 3-3 sure is! Not even a few hops in and you're already met with sliding platforms. More than you need to make the gap. There are some cute coin placements here and there, but what we really care about is this platform that was bought on clearance. He doesn't move side to side or up and down, he just drops when you're standing on him. Which I guess is kind of him, but man, I feel bad that he can't go up. Should you react quick enough to him dropping, you can jump atop these... trees. They look like trees, right? They're trees now. Soon enough, you'll reach the pulley platforms, who have an inseparable bond until they don't. Just be careful to not stay on one for too long, and you'll be fine. Fine enough to meet the sliding platform bros, here to take you on a journey across the land where you'll meet a couple Koopa Troopas. I don't know. Hey look, the pulley's back, and you've got to use it properly to reach the flagpole. That's pretty neat. World 3-4, we're back for more castle levels. This time it's opening up with a mixture of fire bars and potaboos, testing your ability to dodge both at once, which is fair considering you've encountered both obstacles before. This mushroom placement is quite evil, considering that you need to run towards the pit and do a backwards jump to get it before it falls in. Or you can just hit the block in front of it so it changes course. This is one of my favorite sections of all the castle levels. The fire bars feel like gates opening up for you to delve deeper into the dungeon. It helps that Bowser spit some fire the moment you get through the section, as if that's what it was building up to. The potaboos here only enhance the feeling of, God I hope I don't get hit, which is an oddly good feeling to have. The gray blocks in this battle seem intent on messing up your jump over Bowser. The designers really want you to approach this fight from every angle, huh? If you succeed in breaking Bowser's ankles, then you'll save... Toad. World 4-1 finally brings the life back. The last time we saw it was on World 2-3, and all I could see there were cheap cheeps. One of the most interesting enemies is introduced here, the Lakitu, a rad dude that likes throwing down spiky boys from above. This newfound aerial threat is compensated by the rather simple level layout. Sure, he can throw down an enemy or two, but what's that gonna do against running? <laughs> there are hardly any other enemies to be seen, one up. It just feels like a Lakitu wasteland. Oh hey, some plants! 
taking the second one's pipe will bring you to the slidey sub area where you need to slide if you want those coins. Unless you're small, in which case you don't slide, in which case I'm sad. Moving on. The most awkward part of this level is the three pits in a row near the end. Having a lag to chuck enemies down while you're attempting to cross a gap is annoying. Doubly so if the pit already has something blocking it. At least Starry's intact. You never know. We just entered World 4-2 and I'm already scared. Why are there three pits in a row? What did you do to deserve this? What did I do to deserve this? Some careful platforming should be enough to quell our fears, but I wish they didn't need quelling to begin with. This lower section's interesting though. If you're small when you land on the ground, then you can freely enter this path. Grab some coins, a power up, and leave. But if you're big when you land on the ground, then you've gotta go around. Ever been rejected to something because you were too tall? I have, and I'm only 6'2". Moving on, we've got a trio of cannon fodder, followed by a lot of blocks. But that's not the important part. Check out the ceiling! If you make it up there, you can run all the way to these holes that you can jump over, all the way to this hole that you can jump over, and if you keep running, then you'll eventually reach a warp zone! Except, don't do that! It's a bait! I'm not saying it's trying to trick you, I'm saying that you can do better, cause you deserve better. Back up to that moving platform from before, and you'll see this sneaky little vine hidden away in this block. It can be hard to hit since not only is it at an awkward angle, but there's a row of hidden blocks below it too. If you do manage to strike it from below and take the vine up, then you'll end up... at ground level. Huh. Well, I guess there's nothing here. There's a lot of prana plants in this section. You'll end up at another warp zone. One that'll let you skip to world eight. That's great. I don't know what this vine was doing in an underground block, but it contains one of the most random and cool secrets ever. If you don't end up finding that vine, you will end up traversing amongst the many piranha plants along with meeting a new... friend. The Buzzy Beetle. This friend could be defeated like a Koopa Troopa. A simple jump and a kick will do. But fire's a no-go. That shell is tough. What's great is that the very first one seems to be guarding a block with a star in it, which I'd argue isn't actually the best for this level. The upcoming section is full of pits, and we when you grab a star, the first thing on your mind isn't really, hey, I should take things slow. So I wonder if it was an intentional design choice to see if the player would be able to show restraint with such amazing power under their control. One of the plant's pipes from before leads to a really dumb looking sub area, I gotta be honest. The W sub area was so cool and stylish. This one looks like a broken cue, unsure of how to present itself. Get off my screen. Interesting mushroom placement here. It has the potential to fall on a rising platform or miss it entirely and dive straight into the abyss. Don't let him down. He'd never give you up. The few plants ahead aren't a threat and neither is the buzzy on his kindergarten blocks. The weird part is this tight section with a couple Koopa Troopas. You may accidentally run into one if you're not careful. That is, if you're small. Being big has its perks here, since you can just break some blocks and move on to the exit, where there's a riddle giving piranha, apparently. The answer's four. Don't ask me how I know. I always thought there was something funny about a piranha plant popping out of a pipe you were just in. Was Mario running away from it? Now that's terrifying. What a good level. World 4-3, I hope you like platforms cause the designers really wanted to use them this time around. Here we go, a skip and a hop will get you up top, where goodies waiting along with a warm up of what's to come. This single pulley platform leads to rising and falling platforms, a pretty easy maneuver. It's when you move on that you're met with three sets of pulley platforms in a row. You're given some leeway in the form of these mushroom platforms? But man, you are not gonna have a good time unless you have a handle on the pulley physics. If you grooved past those, then it's an easy shot to the end. There's even a little moving platform to help you reach the top of the flagpole. That's pretty cute.
World 4-4, the castle level that you'll either find to be a breeze or a pain. World 4-4, the castle level that you'll either find to be a breeze or a pain. The trick is that certain paths will repeat. The trick is that certain paths will repeat. The trick is that certain paths will repeat. So if you find that happening to you, then choose the right path already. Don't be a pawn in the designer's game of chess. The Bowser fight doesn't have any gray blocks this time. It instead has a fire bar and a potaboo, which I think is actually more threatening. Nice to know that Bowser found himself a couple friends to chill with as you go through the level. World 5-1 bears a slight resemblance to the battlefield that was in World 3-2. You'll see what I mean. It begins with a Koopa Troopa that you can kick and delete everyone behind it with. All the while the two plant boys watch. If you thought that was fun, then you can do it again using this paratroopa. What comes after that? A star! This really is 3-2 all over again. But wait! New enemy, the Bill Blaster. They'll shoot slow moving bullets your way, but who cares? You're probably invincible from this star here, unless you didn't hit the block for some reason. That'll probably last you until this 1-up mushroom. I actually like this section a lot. If you're big and try to hit all the blocks, then you may need to duck under the incoming bullet bill. I just think it's funny because of how obvious they bait you into a bad position here. <laughs> Taking the top piranha's warp pipe will lead you to... No, not the same Q-shaped sub-area from before. Why did they use it again? Where's my W-shaped sub-area? I believe in them. They'll come through. You'll see. Exiting that monstrosity and clobbering a few paratroopas, you'll- What do they do to Starry? They split him in half! C can we put him back together, please? I feel a little bad. Hopefully 5-2 will get us back on track with less cursed layouts and there's a spring, oh no. I thought I'd never see it again, but here it is. Ignoring that, let's back up to the Bill Blaster here. I actually think this is a much better introduction to how it works than when it was first shown in the previous level. That's because here, you'll almost undoubtedly see it shoot a bullet bill and will almost undoubtedly not get hit by it since it'll get launched from a high position. You get the feel for it, you know? Quickly moving past the spring, you'll notice a mushroom or a fire flower if you're big. It's almost like you're being given ammo to use against the upcoming hammer bro, who's now throwing hammers out in the open. Assuming you don't die from him and take the piranha plant's pipe, you'll drown, apparently. Where did this water level come from? And with falling platforms, no less. I guess if you wanted to make water levels in this game interesting, then that's what you do. The platforms have a hitbox, so they will push you down, which can be dangerous if a blooper's approaching you or if you don't want to drown in the pit. The section afterwards is nice though, so no worries there. Oh hey, the exit plops you right in front of two hammer bros, ain't that swell. Let's see what the main route had to offer. Two Goombas, a pit, and another hammer bro. But this time you're given the option to hit him from below, making this encounter more doable. The blocks up top are impossible to hit from ground level, and the jump angles from the other two platforms are too awkward to make either. Fear not, Hidden Block will save the day, allowing you to access the cloudy sub area, which is a freebie this time around, and hey, it drops you right after the Hammer Bros. How kind of it. If you skip both the pipe and the vine, then your punishment is trial by Paratroopa and Bill Blaster, which is an odd combination that doesn't work out much. Fast forward to the Buzzy Beetle trio and you'll find them guarding treasure, which you may need to slide under to properly hit. Okay, yeah, I know it's the star back here. I just didn't want to mention it because it folds these foes easily. I like to think about what the journey would be like without invincibility. Thank you very much. And they hurt Starry again. Why? What did he do to deserve this? He actually becomes deceptively hard to platform in this form. <laughs> Sure, there are only one block gaps, but avoiding them as you ascend after having to deal with a paratroopa is annoying. Keep in mind that unless you took this top route, you have to make a spooky jump over a piranha plant earlier. Regardless, they've got to stop hurting Starry. He didn't do anything. World 5-3's layout is identical to that of World 1-3. 
except the moving platforms are shorter and there are bullet bills being fired from the right side of the screen, kinda like Bowser's fireballs. Well, if the designers are allowed to reuse assets, does that mean I can too? Let's see here... Alright. It begins with raising platform jumps to bring your elevation higher. World 5-4 is... Wait, identical to that of 2-4? What's going on here? Okay, let me pull out 2-4 and compare them. Oh, okay, alright, okay. That, that's pretty cool, actually. I don't know if you see it, but notice how in 2-4 there are brown blocks that don't contain any fire bars? When going through it the first time, it might be a little confusing, like, why are these ones deactivated for whatever reason? But I guess the designers made it that way because they were foreshadowing this level, which has the same layout, but with those fire bars active. That's kinda sick, I like that. They also added a potaboo to the pool here. Oh, and the fire bar that was activated is way longer than what we're used to, making obtaining this power-up a huge risk. I wouldn't blame you if you skipped it, but it might come in handy as you risk losing your hand running through this gauntlet of fire bars. Upon closer inspection, it seems like a potaboo was added to every pool of lava, even the one with the Bowser fight. Sure, it's more trouble you've got to deal with, but at least you get to save Toad again. World 6-1 brings back the Lakitus, who are happy to throw their children at you. And since I assume you're not adopting right now, you must run. Good thing the designers built you some shelter. Seriously, what is this thing? Was it actually designed to protect you from the spinies? I understand why the top part's here, but why this random piece of ground? Ignoring that, you'll go on a fantastical journey across the land, eventually reaching a suspicious block setup that, when investigated, will result in a glorious 1-Up Mushroom. Are you ready for my favorite hidden blocks in the game? Okay, here it goes. These two right here. They don't lead to a mushroom, a star, a 1-Up Mushroom, a vine, or any higher platforms. Their sole purpose is to bring you high enough to kill Lakitus. If that ain't the most petty thing I've ever seen. I'm imagining Miyamoto and Tezuka dying on their own level too many times, saying screw it and adding these dev blocks to kill the flying rascals. It's just great. Speaking of hidden blocks, you'd expect one to be in the middle of these blocks, but there isn't. Go figure. A little more effort and you'll end up at Starry, who's broken again. They can't keep getting away with this. I hope you like jungles, because that's what World 6-2 is about. I am not kidding. This whole place is infested with piranha plants. Heck, the first enemy you can encounter is one. With a pipe you can enter. And that leads you to a sub area in the shape of... No. <laughs> they seriously used the queue a third time? Miyamoto, Tezuka, I believed in you. Bring back the W-shaped sub area. I'm sick of looking at this atrocious abomination. Get me out of here. I've got to say, there really are a lot of piranha plants. Imagine checking all of these pipes for sub areas. Oh look, another one. And drowning again, how fun. Now all we need is the cloudy sub area and we'll have a level that contains all three. Is that a vine? Hello clouds. Do you have any clue how easy this level must be if you have a fire flower? You can just burn every piranha plant you come across. The only thing that'd be in your way would be the buzzy beetles who are immune to fire. You know the designers did that on purpose. This star is in a dangerous spot. You have to jump from this platform below to hit its block, but that will likely cause you to fall to ground level where you might squeeze into the small gaps. Gotta be careful about that. If the star is obtained, then you become a living weed whacker. Every piranha plant's worst nightmare. Oh, they took over Starry. Oh, I mean, at least he's not broken. He's got friends now. Ooh, is that some grass at the base of the flagpole? That's a neat detail. World 6-3, I hope you weren't expecting any enemies other than bullet bills, cause that's what you're getting. This place constantly tests your ability to perform precision jumping onto moving platforms, even when that jump is propelled off of a spring, which can thankfully be skipped. This mushroom is in a mean spot. It's entirely possible to hit the block just for it to fall into the dark abyss. At this point, the designers expect you to time your block hit so that doesn't happen to you. 
The pulley platforms are back, and wow do you need to jump high to reach the first one. They are putting in zero effort to accommodate. Quite rude of them. Take a few paces and you'll meet with the first spring's brother, whom I do not like anymore. I in fact hate both of them. They kill me. If you're lucky enough to reach the sliding platform and hop across, then you'll meet the most dangerous platforms of all. They will give you up, they will let you down, and they will hurt you. Surpass them and you'll come upon the castle. Why is it gray? World 6-4 has the same layout as World 1-4, except all the fire bars are activated now and a few potaboos were thrown in. Even with all that, I don't think this castle is much to fear until you reach the long corridor with five fire bars. If you're not taking your time, then it's really easy to trip up here. I honestly thought that these hidden blocks would be different in this hard mode version of the level, but no, they're just a bunch of hidden blocks. Go figure. This arena looks fairly easier until you consider that Bowser added hammers to his arsenal. I guess all's fair in lava and war. World 7-1 marks the point where the designers start getting sadistic. Frame 1, a Bill Blaster is ready to shoot directly at you, which you might just pass off as tough love, but nope, two more Bill Blasters are shooting at differing heights as well. These heights aren't high above you or down below you, they're right in your face, and it's up to you to move out of the way. There's no better way the designers could say that they aren't messing around anymore. There's still a mushroom for you to obtain, but it's likely that it'll fall to the ground, where there are bullet bills being blasted. Not very fun. On your first go through, you may think there's something of value in these question mark blocks and risk the bullet bills and paratrooper hitting you. Sadly, there is nothing of value and it's a waste of time to even try. Kinda cruel. Further on, not only are bullet bills still shooting everywhere at ground level, but there's one up above now trying to snipe you. Oh, but don't worry, there's a piranha plant here. Surely that means the worst is over, right? Double Hammer Bros here to ruin your life! Make it past them, and then you can access a sub area for a few coins. Oh, the exit? Just a couple pipes away, nothing big. Let's hope you got that 1-up mushroom from the hidden block from earlier, cause there was next to no hint that it exists. If those previous Hammer Bros weren't enough by the way, then here's two more. Conquer them, and you're rewarded with two Bill Blasters ready to clean up shop. And if they don't do the trick, then you must face one of Bowser's most terrifying minions. No, I'm not talking about the Buzzy on top of Starry, I'm talking about the Spring! World 7-2 has World 2-2's layout, but with added bloopers along with cheap cheeps that spawn from the right side of the screen. Having them around makes this place feel a lot more like an ocean you're swimming through. I can understand why some people may get annoyed at the way bloopers read your movements, but I've always found something so chill about water levels, you know? World 7-3 has World 2-3's layout, but with added cheap cheeps along with several Koopa Troopa variations. Now look, for someone that's played the game before a great deal, running like a maniac and avoiding all the flying cheap cheeps may be easy, but when I played through here years ago, these guys were my nightmare. 2-3's version of this level was difficult for me. The Koopa Troopas can make this level easier though. If you kick their shells and follow them, then you might see them knock out a few cheap cheeps along the way, like they deserve. World 7-4 takes a backseat on brutal enemy placement or precision jumping and instead opts in for puzzles. That is, if you count needing to take the correct path order as a puzzle at all. I'm not really for this kind of design. I get that it's supposed to be a trial and error thing where you remember the paths you took and go for the ones you haven't yet, but I don't feel accomplishment overcoming the puzzle. It's more like a glad that's over kind of feeling, especially with the second puzzle. You've got to do this awkward maneuver where you take the top path, fall down to the middle path and carefully hop through and back up to the top path. I can totally see how others may have found it fun, but me, not so much. After those puzzles, you'll be met with those classic fireballs along with more holes than you can imagine. I swear, if you get hit by a fireball when there are these many safeguards, then maybe Bowser deserves to win. Just like in Six Forest Castle, he'll be throwing hammers as well. So that's definitely something to look out for as you save not Peach, 
but another toad. World 8-1 is the longest level in the game, the coming of the end if you will, and yet the designers are still intent on forcing a bunch of Goombas to march behind a shell enemy at the beginning of the level. You might be thinking, well Zoomzike, isn't it better for the Goombas that they got a Buzzy Beetle as an ally instead of a Koopa Troopa? No! With the Koopa Troopa, you can kill him via fireball, meaning that the Goombas behind him would at least get a chance to fight. But the Buzzy Beetle here is immune to fire, meaning the only way the player can vanquish him is through a jump and a kick, thereby ensuring all the Goombas' demise. They need to sue or something. These one block gaps may look dangerous like you've got to precisely jump on each platform, but that's not exactly true. See, the designers placed a couple Koopas here, hoping you would jump and kick one. If you do, then that'll send the shell safely over the one block gaps, teaching you that as long as you're going fast enough, you can run straight over them. This coin feels like a random reward for jumping until you realize it's aligned with a bunch of other coins and a 1-up mushroom further in the level. I swear, the hints for these 1-up mushrooms get more obscure as time goes on. The sub area for this level is... Oh, this one. Okay, it's chill. Easy coins. And you only pop out a few feet from the entrance. Not sure what I expected, considering it's one of the last levels, but hey, there are a ton of Koopas ready to greet you and absolutely demolish one another. Ain't that great? What I like more, though, is this little arena that was set up to fight this paratroopa. The walls are high enough to the point where he'll stay in there even if you ignore him. You might go in for a jump just to bonk your head against the hidden block. I wouldn't call this cruel, just a little mean, like a slap on the wrist for trying to ruin the designer's fun. The one block gaps are back, except this time paratroopers were carefully placed to hop on each bit of land. This makes running across the gaps like before a bit more difficult. You can still risk it, sure, but there's gonna be that little part of you that wants to jump on these guys instead and watch them fall into the abyss. This stars an easy nap, and when it's grabbed, nothing really stands in your way until you get to these pipes. The first gap is one block wide, but the second and third gaps are two blocks wide. So if you're running at full speed with the star like a madman and don't react fast enough to this new obstacle, then you might spell your own doom. These monsters don't have it easy. Either they get vanquished by a juiced up Mario bulldozing through them, or the buzzy beetles used as ammo for eliminating the rest. I'm sure you'll get past the guilt. Getting past these three block gaps is fairly reasonable, and that's because they're building you up to perform actually difficult jumps across a five block gap, followed by a four block gap with a single block to stand on in the middle. Your only friends in this situation are the coins marking about where you should be when making these jumps. They're rooting for you. And so are the Koopas soon after, but something tells me you just kill them anyways. Starry, no, we've gone so many levels with you intact, you can't get broken up by the end. That's it, I hereby make a vow that this video ends the next time I see Starry hurt. World 8-2 begins with... Wait, wait, false alarm, that isn't Starry. He only shows up at the end of a level, we're still safe. It is peculiar to see such a large staircase placed at the beginning though. Honestly, it's rather threatening, like the designers are telling you this is the beginning of the end. <laughs> There's a couple one block gaps, paratroopers that are hopping down the staircase, and to top it all off, cause he's above in the clouds, there's a Lakitu throwing down spinies. Isn't that splendid, Zoomzak asks. No, it is not, you respond. I can see someone having a lot of trouble on this opening section, myself included. There's a one-up mushroom placed directly above the spring, making it highly likely you'll cause it to appear. But it can't be too easy, oh no. The designers made a long path for the one-up boy to travel along that you've gotta follow before you obtain him. This path includes multiple one block gaps along with their best buddies, the Hop and Paratroopas. They've really started popping up recently, huh? Well after them, you can grab your goodie and get greeted with three Bill Blasters all shooting at different heights at ground level. What I think's even spookier is how these blocks are placed in the middle of this war zone. Just daring you to hit them while being bombarded with bullet bills and other shell enemies. But would you believe me? 
if I said things get even spookier. Look at the six block gap with only one block pieces of land. I can't count how many times I died here back then. Moving on, we've got a build up to the end of the level. There's a few paratroop assessor pass, a mini staircase, and... No, even though he's been heard, we can't end the video here. Not when we're so close to the end. He'd want us to continue onwards. Oh, but first we gotta check this level sub area, which is the last underground sub area in the entire game. And it looks like... World 8-3. Despite not having a super interesting layout, this is my favorite level in the game. Why? because it feels like Bowser's last stand against you before you enter his castle. The backdrop has walls meant to prevent intruders from getting in. There are hammer bros left and right for airtight security, and blocks serving as obstacles to blatantly tell you that you won't get a clean shot to the end. What hammers this point home the hardest though, is what I like to call Bowser's Elite Four, consisting of four hammer bros all spread out on even ground with you. There's also this block that blends in super well with the backdrop, so finding it is a real surprise. What I wish wasn't a surprise is finding Starry in his worst state yet. Every other time we see him, he's either cut in half, has pieces missing, or a warp pipe is through him. And here, Bowser's nearly wiped him out of existence. But despite all the pain and suffering he's endured, despite being on the brink of death, he used his final moments to painstakingly stretch his body out as far as it can go, all so you can access the final castle and end this nightmare. A salute for our fallen comrade. World 8 Four, the final level, and one that, dare I say, has theming to it. Looking back, every time you defeated Bowser, he turned out to be one of his minions in disguise. Each battle was a fraud from the start, and why do you think that is? Why do you think Bowser himself didn't try and fight you from the beginning? Because he's scared of you. It's already evident from the fake Bowsers, but World 8-3 makes it clear enough. He threw his entire arsenal at you, in hopes that it'd be enough to stop you from reaching him. But alas, you've arrived in his domain. And even now, he's hoping he won't have to look you in the eye. What makes me say that? Because this place was designed to prevent you from reaching him. It opens by introducing you not to a wealth of enemies, but to two pipes. When entering the second one, it does something no pipe has done before, and that's sending you backwards in the level, wasting your time and negating your progress. A simple yet perfect section of the level that captures the essence of what Bowser wants most right now and it's only going to get more evil. If you fell for the pipe loop at the beginning, then you might have vowed to yourself to not enter any more pipes in this level again. Well, the section immediately afterwards dismantles that plan, because if you skip the upcoming pipes and march onwards, you'll loop back to the beginning. This lets you know that you have to take your chances with the pipes in order to progress. And when you do, you'll be met with a couple buzzy beetles and paratroopas, but which pipe to enter? Ignoring them will loop you back to this section, so you have to choose one, and if you're wrong, then back to the beginning you go. The only indication of the correct pipe is that one of them is in a unique spot compared to the others, being up in the air but it doesn't help that it comes last, meaning that it's likely that players will have already tried out the pipes before it, thus suffering from the loop back around. This same scenario plays out in the next section, where the first accessible pipe is the wrong one, and still, painfully, sends you back to the start. It's only when you enter the last pipe of the section that the pipe does what it's supposed to. That is, if attempting to drown you was what it was supposed to do. This is the last sub area of the game, and it takes place underwater with fire bars. 
Hey, if you're allowed to shoot fire into water, then Bowser's allowed to have these guys, alright? The bloopers only make this place scarier, as they move you into awkward positions while you try to avoid getting burned. Should you overcome this hardship, you'll be met with the last warp pipe in the game. Keep in mind that a first timer doesn't know that this is the last warp pipe, and since it's next to a hammer bro, there's a decent chance the player, possibly you, will try and enter this pipe out of want or just sheer habit. And where does it lead? Where else but the very beginning of the level. It's Bowser's final trick to prevent a battle with you. And if it doesn't work, or if you come back from the trap, then you must get past his final line of defense. A single hammer bro accompanied by a potaboo. When that's done, his worst nightmare is realized and he is forced to do battle with you, the one that overcame all the minions, castles, and tricks he threw at you. In this battle, there are no other obstacles. No gray blocks, no spare enemies, just you and him, who spits fire, throws tons of hammers, and jumps, just desperate to finally rid himself of you, but to no avail. Upon touching the axe, you won't be defeating a mere puppet, but the real deal. Bowser, the king of the Koopas, who spread his empire too thin. As the bridge plummets and he along with it, you finally reach the princess, who thanks you for all the adversity you endured, even if some of it was almost too much to bear. Thus marking the end of Super Mario Bros a legendary game created by legendary people. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you next time. Take care.